All right, so we want to sketch the probability densities of this uh, solution over here, psi x. Okay, and basically, uh, we're going to sketch this thing, take the magnitude of the wave function, and we square that based on the certain regions over there. Now, I do not want to go into the rigorous calculations. We will carry out a on-the-surface qualitative analysis, okay, if there's such a word for it. So, and how does that work? Well, let's just see what we can get. Okay, now, remember, I would take the magnitude of the, the wave solutions, okay? Now, in this case, the solution that I'm going to take is psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. I did mention somewhere in my appendix that when we are sketching the probability densities for these oscillating waves, as long as they, they, they are not decaying, we will always take both of them, okay? That, that's the reason why I did not cancel the E out. Technically, you don't need to take both of them, but for a more complete picture, we want to take both of them. And we know because if I uh, take the magnitude of it and I square that, let's just say if I do that for psi 1, Okay, which is uh, applicable to this region over here, x is less than a divided by 2, I will get something like, oh sorry, okay, this is, uh, yeah, minus, okay. I will get something like, it's equals to, okay, a certain value, and then I'll get uh, a constant over here, and I'll get a sine squared function, right? A sine squared function, but it's going to be k1x. Okay, so remember, once I take the magnitude and I square that, I will just uh, change the transcendental numbers to cosine and sine terms, and I know that I will get a sine squared. The argument is actually this argument over here, less the, the imaginary i, okay? Is that argument over there. So that's for psi 1. Now, if I do that for psi 3, what do we uh, suspect? Uh, psi 3, we also suspect the same thing, okay? The, the amplitude is going to be different, okay? The amplitude of the two trigonometry sine functions is going to be different, but at least I can say that the argument is going to be the same, which is basically k1x. Why? Because there's a k1x over here. No surprise that for psi 2, the argument is going to change. For psi 2, is going to be plus sine squared k2x. Okay, k2x. Now, let me just uh, work on this space over here. Now, by looking at k2 and k1, I can see that for k1, it's the energy value minus the potential. So it's obvious that k2 is greater than k1. Now, if k2 is greater than k1, I, can, I would know that the period of the probability density for psi 2 is going to be higher than the period of the probability densities of psi 1 and psi 3. Okay, because as you can see, psi 1 and psi 3, the argument of the sine function is k1x, but for psi 2 is uh, k2x, k2 is 1 and k1, so the period of the probability density function over here is going to be more. Now, that is only half the story, because the other half of the story, I need to go into the amplitude, the amplitude of the trigonometry function. The amplitude of the sine function would dictate the amplitude of the probability density function, okay? Uh, let's just say that the probability density function is like that. Okay, if I know that the amplitude of uh, a sine term is greater than the amplitude of this sine term over here, given that the sine terms are the same, the, the graph is going to be like this. Okay, the amplitude is going to be more. So that's why I need to also calculate the amplitudes. Now, if you want to go into calculating the amplitudes, you basically need to take the probability density of each of these side 1, side 2, side 3, you need to square that, and then later, you need to rearrange for, for uh, A, B, C, D, E, F based on the continuity conditions, okay, which is a long process, but let's just use what knowledge we know from the previous problem, which is the potential barrier. Okay, now, you need to trust me on this, but if I'm able to, say, extend this potential over here like this, right, so I'm going to extend this potential over here like this, you'll see that we have something like a potential barrier, okay, a potential barrier, so now let's just say the particle is traveling this way. And from our potential barrier, what we know is that as the particle goes to a point where the, there's a potential drop, just like there is over here, the particle starts over here at the, at the region where the potential is V0, and then there's a potential drop, the amplitude is going to increase, right? The amplitude is going to increase. That is what we know from our potential step. So we can at least graph out the first part, which is psi 1 and psi 2. So let's just say I start with a normal probability density function. Now, you have to ignore this uh, y-axis because now it's not the potential. Now it's the probability density, okay? I'm just changing the axis. The potential, let's just leave that is over there for illustration purposes. So let's just say I start with a certain wave function, which I will just nicely draw as like that. Okay, uh, sorry, the probability density function. So what do I know? Now I know that at this point when I reach to the region, um, x is between minus a divided by 2 and a divided by 2. I got a sine squared function with a k2x. I know k2 is greater than k1, so I know it's going to oscillate more. And not only that, since I draw certain knowledge from the potential barrier, there will be a drop in potential, so the amplitude is also going to increase. Okay, I did not do did the rigorous calculations using the continuing conditions, but that is what I will eventually get. Okay, so it's gonna go something like this. Okay, higher amplitude but increased period. 
sorry, higher amplitude and increased period. There we go, higher amplitude and an increased period. Fine. Now, when I hit this point over here, the period is going to remain the same. So the period is going to stay the same as over here. But as I say again, you need to take my word for it. If we use some inequality calculations, we are able to show that the amplitude of this sine function over here, which is the amplitude of the sine function uh, for the probability density side 3, is going to be less than the amplitude of the sine function for the probability density of side 1. And that is why the amplitude is going to be smaller compared to this probability density over here. And I'll sketch it like this. Okay, sketch it like this. Okay, and the period of this is supposed to be the same, which I did my best. Okay, it doesn't look the same. So anyways, that is what we have. Now, we have sketched out the probability densities over here. Now, is it consistent with these transmission and reflection coefficients? Well, yeah, kind of, because now we, we know that really the particle can be found in this region over here. There's some transmission of particles, but the, really the difference in the probability densities suggests to us that that only a portion of the particles has been transmitted over, possibly given by the by the decrease in amplitude. Okay, now this is not too clear. Maybe I should draw it like this. Okay, in the decrease in amplitude, like we have over there. So there it is. Okay, now I know that this is a qualitative analysis, but if you know you want to go through the rigorous calculations, you can do that. So now, finally, our last step is to find out whether is this probability density a physical solution, just like how we have dealt with the free particle. Okay, so the free particle is coming back. This is quite a nice problem because it connects really a lot of areas together. Okay, so um, that is to say that I just used my simple plane argument, which, which I think is you can use it anytime, you know, just to show whether a, a solution is unphysical. Is that as you can see, since this goes to minus infinity to infinity, hence the continuous energy spectrum and the scattering solutions, you know, I can just simply integrate from here to here and get a certain probability, such as maybe say 2, okay, by changing the width and just integrate from here to here, get a certain probability, say let's just say 4, and because it's uh, 2 plus 4, the probability of finding a particle there is 6, which we know is absurd, it doesn't make sense, so the solutions are unphysical, okay? As long as you have these oscillating waves that go from minus infinity to infinity, you know that they are unphysical. Okay, and as we know, you know, they can't be normalized, okay, and because of that, we need to carry out our certain mathematical process to make them physical, which is the Fourier transform. Okay, but before we go into the Fourier transform, I just want to just draw your attention to just one of the solutions, which, which maybe it would, you would uh, be thinking about. Now, notice that Psi 2, where we sketch the probability density of Psi 2, okay, and, we, and bearing in mind that Psi 2 is only applicable for x between minus a divided by 2 and a divided by 2, we get this function over here, okay? Yes, it's an oscillating function, but it's actually an oscillating function function that's bounded between x to uh, x equals to minus a divided by two and a divided by two. Now, I can apply the normalizing conditions, which let me just erase this uh, away from the board. Remember, what is the normalizing condition? If I integrate in this case from minus a divided by two to a divided by two of the of the probability density function, in this case the mental of side uh, side two squared uh, dx, and set that equals to one. I can get a certain factor, and I'll put that factor in front of side 2 to normalize the, the wave, uh, the probability density function. And when I normalize the probability density function, I will get uh, an oscillating solution, but the area over here is actually equals to 1. Okay? Remember, side 2 does not go from minus infinity to infinity because the solution is bounded from x between minus a divided by 2 and a divided by 2. So since you know, I can normalize it, then you might be thinking, okay, maybe, just maybe, this is a physical solution. Okay, well, the answer, if you have a quick think about it, is actually no, because the solutions to the problem is actually not this side 1, side 2, and side 3. Side 1, side 2, and side 3 um, uh, builds up the solution to the Schrodinger equation, which is ultimately psi itself. So, yes, we can normalize the probability density of psi 2 and make it 1, but it still wouldn't make sense, okay? Because even though this is 1, we can still find all these additional probabilities at the regions when x is less than a divided by 2 and when x is more than a divided by 2, we are still left with the same argument that, you know, how can the probability be greater than 1? So obviously, yes, can, we can normalize it, but that is not the ultimate solution to the problem, or, you know, more specifically, it's not a solution at all.